The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. I want to start then for a season to begin a Christmas series this morning. It's going to run for five weeks, and my purpose is I want us to begin to prepare our hearts to worship God in the fullness of joy for the gift that He gave this world. For God so loved this world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a beautiful thing that God gave His Son to this world, and I want us to open up the fullness of that. So at this time of year, the world starts fighting and seeking to put our focus on all of the trappings of Christmas and not the sweet Christ who was born into this world for sinners. We begin to focus on that which is going to leave us empty at the end of it instead of that which will make us full at the end of this season. And so I want us to come to that this morning marveling and singing glory to God in the highest for the salvation that He has prepared for us in Christ Jesus. And so the way I'd like to approach this is I want to begin looking through the Old Testament And I want to look at the pictures and the promises of the seed that would be born into this world, the one who would come and save us from our sins. And I want to have in our minds and hearts then that amazing fulfillment of the baby that that lay in a manger, a donkey's dish, that was born to Joseph and Mary that blessed Christmas morn. And I want to encourage then all the moms and dads to to take these sermons, and I want you to spend time making sure that your kids understand them and behold them, and and I want Jesus to eclipse Santa Claus in their hearts. I want to come to Christmas and everyone in this room know the one who came to save this world, and that's what I'm going to be asking God for, is that every heart would prepare him room and everyone would receive King Jesus. And so to that end, let us go to the throne of grace and ask our God and Father to grant us this blessing. So let's ask our God for this great mercy. Father, I come before you and no human can reveal the glories of God in the face of Christ. And so we ask for you to do what only you can do through your spirit and your word. I pray that as we study and look at these things that you would open them up, that they wouldn't just be letters on a page, but we would see the face of Christ. We would see the, your glory as a saving God and sending your son into this world. What we look at this morning, God, is so beautiful. I pray that you would meet us. I pray for everyone in this room, God, that they would know the Savior world. And I love our, our little children. God, I pray that every one of them would, would have faith in this Christ, that this would be a very special time as a church where you would blow through and do mighty things as we look each week at this promised seed who would come into the world as a Savior. Oh God, thank you for Christ Jesus, and it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen. Well, our first sermon in the series, if you will turn to Genesis 3, we're going to go back to the beginning. I want to look uh, at Genesis chapter 3, and I want to see the first promise of this salvation that we now possess uh, in Christ. And it comes to us really in the midst of pronouncing curse and judgment upon the devil himself for the sin that he did in leading our first parents, Adam and Eve, into destruction and death. Right in the middle of it, we get this Christmas promise, the salvation. In the midst of God declaring the curse that would befall the devil himself for his rebellion and his destruction of mankind in the world as we know it. And so as God is pronouncing this doom upon them, the devil, we see the large heartedness of our God just breaks out right in the midst of it. And he tells us what his gracious purposes are for his people. It's as if he can't hold it back. The beauty of what God is doing, even in Lucifer's undoing of the creation. He wants to let us know that the devil is a lackey that was seeking the worst for God and all of his created beings. And God's going to take what he has done and bring forth the most beautiful diamond that you could ever imagine in Jesus Christ. Such destruction and evil will shine forth. And in this verse this morning, the fullness of the glory of God like no other. When the devil and mankind were at their very worst, 
our gracious and merciful God was at his very best. Even in judgment and cursing, he declares his intention of putting on display his glory by being a saving God through grace alone what he will do in his Son. So what a context that we find our first Christmas promise in history. And my heart just leapt as I looked at it this week. And all that came to mind after studying this chapter was what we just sang in Romans 5, that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The the table that God has prepared in Genesis 3, I I pray that we will eat of it uh, and be blessed. Now let's let's, uh, begin in Genesis 3. The first point I want to bring uh, to you this Christmas season is that Jesus would come into the world to undo what the devil had done in Genesis chapter 3. And I want you to listen to what John wrote. Um, I believe Sean Killian preached on this, but I just want to read it again. 1 John 3, 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the very beginning, and that's what we're going to look at. The Son of God has appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. He's going to come into the world to destroy the works of the devil and what he's done to undo us and this creation that happened in Genesis 3. He's going to come and he's going to fix what we're going to study here this morning. And so let us come and look at how far reaching and destructive the work of the devil was. How extensive and healing then the gospel of salvation is, where sin increased, grace overabounded, it covered it, it it took it in. And so we're going to see that when that devil increased sin, God makes a promise where grace is going to abound and take care of the works of the devil for the children of God. Martin Luther once said, the book of Romans is the whole Bible in one book. And he said, Genesis 3.15 is the whole Bible in one verse. Sinclair Ferguson, the great preacher, said the whole Bible is an extended footnote of this verse. Genesis 3.15, we will look at. And so let me set the context of the passage and then we will unfold its beauty this morning. I got some good news for you. The context is only two chapters. (laughs) That should make you feel comfortable. It won't be a long introduction at all. What I love about the first three chapters of Genesis, of this Bible is you get some really big answers to life's hardest questions. Where did the universe come from? How how did it come into being? Where where did humans come from? I was a kid, I used to spend hours on that. Why, Why were we made? There's this picture of marriage and this beautiful paradise that we're going to look at that God designed. Then in chapter 3, some major foundational answers to this world that we live in. As I look at this world, why is it so broken? Why can nobody fix it? (laughs) Republicans and Democrats can't fix it. And then we see the fall. It destroyed what God made. And then there's this devil here. with He says there's going to be two seeds now for the rest of history that are going to war against each other. And we've watched uh, Christians being killed. There have been more Christians killed in the last hundred years than the first 1900. It's just an incredible what's going on in the waging of of evil and good and what we see on a daily basis. Here's your answers. There's a chief diamond called the Son of God who's going to come and make all things new and restore it back to God's design. The way that it runs rightly is when everything is under God. And that's how this whole history of the world is going to conclude. And so I just want to give you a quick summary of chapters 1 through 2. There's a creation. God speaks this world into being, and when you look at this world and the beauty and the way it's built, it demands a creator. And we see right away how this whole world came into being, a God who spoke it. And as he spoke it on each day in creation, he'd say, it's good, it's good, in this this rhythmic way, it's good. What he created is good, it's good. Everything has been ordered by God, and it's beautiful. God is at the center of it all. He's worshipped and he's loved by his creation. And we have uh, Adam, and we have peace within ourselves. Adam is walking with God in the garden. They're in agreement. There's a love relationship. They're communing. They have peace with each other. God makes marriage, and then we get the switch to it's very good. And it says they're naked and unashamed, that there's no guilt, and there's no shame. 
Creation, you don't have to work it. It produces for you. Adam's naming animals as they walk by. Nice tiger, good cobra. And everything's just in harmony and unity and peace. It's paradise. Did it stay that way? No, but it's going to end that way, but even better. Better because the fullness of God's plan and redemption in Jesus Christ is going to be fully known and displayed and there will be no threat of another fall for all of eternity. We will be secured and sealed, signed, sealed, delivered for all of eternity in this paradise that will be regained. So this morning, my focus is to show you then what happened to paradise. Why is the world that we're living in this morning so far from the beauty of Genesis 1 through 2? And if I gave you the short answer, it's sin. Sin is what happened. Sin entered the world and death spread to all men. And this morning we'll see what sin did to this beautiful paradise that God created. And so I'm going to give you your outline this morning as we flow through Genesis. Moses is going to show us three aspects to the fall of mankind and what happened. In verses 1 through 7, we're going to see a coercion by the devil. In verses 8 through 13, we're going to see a confrontation by God. And then verses 14 through 22, we're going to see the cursing that God will now bring upon this nation, this world. And so in in Sunday school, we had a bunch of C's, and I'm trying to follow the same way, and I had to force a couple just like Sean did uh, this morning. So coercion's not the best word, but we're going to go with it. Uh, Genesis 3, look with me, in verses 1 through 7. We could spend months in this chapter, but I I just don't want to get too bogged down in the details because it doesn't serve the purpose that we're after this morning. But the flow is so important to the beauty of the diamond that I want you to look at that let's just kind of move through it. Start in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So right away now we're introduced to a serpent. Who is this one introduced into creation account? I haven't seen a serpent in chapter 1 through 2. Well, Revelation 12, 9 tells us who this serpent is. It says, The great dragon was thrown down, and the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So they're created, they sin, they're cast down. His name is the devil, slanderer, Satan, which means accuser. He's called the evil one. Beelzebul, the the prince of all the demons. Paul called him the god of this world. This is the one then that we are meeting now in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And as we're introduced to him, he's already evil. He is evil here in verse 1. And the question is, where did he come from? There's no introduction, just boom, here's a devil, he's evil, he's slanderous. And the scriptures give us some clues on, who, on him, and I want to look at a couple. Listen to Jude 1.6. The angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. 2 Peter 2.4, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them into pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And so we have these great hosts of holy angels in heaven, in, in creation. Just they're, they're worshiping God. They're serving the Godhead. And some didn't stay in that position of authority and privilege. They sinned with an insurrection in heaven. They didn't want to be subordinate to God. They were self-exalting and self-governing. And we're told that a third of them, with their leader Satan, were cast down from heaven, the demons and the devil himself. And now we have Satan then in Genesis 3, tempting Adam and Eve to bring destruction then to this beautiful paradise that God has created. Satan and the demons have absolutely no part then of fellowship with God. They don't have the joy of submission to God where where everything is right and we're trusting Him and living under that allegiance to God. They've come out from under it and they've been cast down. And Satan then wants to destroy paradise because he hates God. He hates anyone who loves Him and enjoys Him. And he seeks to undo this whole thing that God just created. And my question is, I have a couple, but why would a sovereign God allow a devil to do this. 
Why would he not just wipe them out right now? Take them out. Why wait till Revelation 20 where it says this in verse 10? The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. There's the end of the devil at the end of time, the end of history, put in there, cast in forever. Why doesn't he do, why does he wait thousands and thousands of years? He should have just got him right there. Well, it's so beautiful. Why wait for a thousand years letting him wreak this havoc on mankind? God has all authority and all power over him. We see it from cover to cover of Scripture. Why not throw him in the lake right now? We see his authority at the end of history and he throws him in there forever. Why wait? And I got the best answer for you at the end of the sermon if you stay awake. It's a little teaser because some of you look sleepy. <coughs> Let's work through this then. In verse 1, the deceiver begins then and he comes and he says to the woman, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And he's beginning to have her now question what God has said. In verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Now he's questioning the judgment, the justice of God. You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes are going to be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Questioning God, the, the serpent. He's telling Eve now, he, God has withheld something from you. Look at paradise and all that you have. The beauty of what God's created. Here's the devil's lie to every soul ever since. He's tempted him here to distrust God. Does God really have your best? I mean, you're living in paradise. He's kept something back from you, Eve. And if you eat of this tree, you're going to be like him. You're going to know good and evil. And so God's withheld something special. You'll be, you could become like God if you eat from this tree. And there's some truth there that God does know good and evil. But he knows it in a way of omniscience. And the lie is that you will know it, but you're going to know it experientially. And God was so good in withholding that from them that they wouldn't know evil experientially in their own hearts and in their own lives and their world that they're morally perfect, they're naked and unashamed. They, they've, they've got it all. And can you imagine what it would be like to have no shame? There's just purity, there's no sin, there's no wrong thinking. You can look in the mirror and be okay. And they're just, there's just no guilt. Here they are. Now you're going to know evil experientially. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and she ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. C.S. Lewis said she was unwilling to bow her mind and her heart to the infinite merciful God and now she bows to a vegetable or a fruit. The brokenness of sin is that we will bow our knee to the things that God has made rather than to the creator of it all who has said, you shall not eat. Of this tree. Romans 1 says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The dark exchange of God for what He's created. Verse 7 then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loin coverings. And so here's the fall of mankind. Now they do know good and evil, but they know it experientially. And now suddenly they're ashamed. Now they know they're guilty. They know these things and they're ashamed and they feel guilty. The history of the world then is they make these loin coverings and we're trying to make coverings for our shame. And all of us are looking for ways to cover our shame, whether it's through accomplishment, uh, morality, going to church, accomplishing things in the business world. Everyone is trying to cover their shame and their guilt through some means, maybe even religion. 
And this is what has happened, then I want you to see the plunge of mankind. This sin has plunged paradise now into destruction. And so the coercion is to mistrust God and come out from his allegiance of what he's commanded and told you to do. And so they mistrust him. He hasn't given them all that they need to be blessed, and they eat from the tree. A second point that I want to look at then is now there's a confrontation. And God is going to come into the garden now, and he's going to confront uh, Adam and Eve. <clears throat> look with me in verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so they're walking with God in the garden. There's relationship, there's oneness, and now there's a hiding because of sin and guilt and shame. And we hide from God because of our guilt. We can't look him. We know who we are. We know who he is. And now this is all of the history of the world is people hiding from God. What a brokenness from relationship and walking and fellowship with God to now hiding from God. And verse 9, the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And it isn't that God didn't know where he is. God is now working with Adam to help him realize what he has done. And verse 10, Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and look what's happened. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. There is the brokenness of sin. I'm now naked. I'm ashamed and I've got to hide from the presence of God. In verse 11, he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman. <laughs> There's the, they had such a perfect marriage. <laughs> they were naked and ashamed and they were just so, they're going to leave father and mother. Everything was so perfect. And now the woman, and it really who he's blaming is God, whom you gave to be with me. She gave me from the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. What has happened to paradise? What, what made it paradise was that everything was under God. All of creation was ordered under God and it was right and sweet and beautiful and sin now has entered the world and death has come to all men. And so who, who had been given, the, they've been given every blessing that could be possibly given to mankind in this creation. And the devil made them doubt that God had given you everything that you need for blessing, for eternal bliss. You, you doubt it. Something else will actually make you happy other than God and being under him and enjoying all the blessings that come with it. You can't trust God. To sit in judgment now of the goodness and the morality of God, they're judging him and they, they question him and they come under him and they sin against him. And he still sows the devil the same message today. If I really can, can't trust God, can I trust him? What, what will I trust? If I can't trust God, I've got to trust something in this world for my security and my hope and my purpose because I can't trust God. That everything will break down because the soul is so great that nothing else but the greatness of God will ever satisfy your soul. It was made for God and it will always be restless till it finds its rest in thee, O oh God. Listen to what John MacArthur says about the state of our first parents now. All who have ever been born from Adam ever since. We come into the world and we disobey God to our own will. We lost fellowship with God and we are now born estranged from God. We have the sentence of death upon us. We now all will die physically and then spiritually. There's an unwillingness to acknowledge sin and we blame others as we just saw. They're concerned only for the evils of the consequence of sin and not to the evil itself of distrusting God and sinning against him. And probably the saddest part of this passage is they cannot repent. You can't turn from it. On your own, you cannot repent or turn from this condition now that we've all been plunged into. The only hope is the mercy and grace of God. That is the rune that Adam, our representative head, has brought everyone now who's been born from Adam. So we see the coercion of the devil 
and he got them to mistrust God and to think that he's withholding from them and they disobeyed what God had asked and they sinned and plunged it all with us. And now we come and we have this confrontation by God and we see the results and the fruit. And what I want to close with now is in the cursing that comes in verses 14 through 22. And what I want you to see then is that we were born then as relational creatures. We're different than the animals, the trees. We've been made for relationship with God and with each other. And so we're just relational creatures and everything was rightly related to us before the fall. We were right with God. We were right with Adam and Eve. We were right with creation. Everything was good and now the curse has come and sin has destroyed every one of our relationships. It destroyed our relationship with God. In verse 8, God came walking into the garden, and it's a way of saying that to, to have fellowship, to have friendship with God. And so he comes in the garden, they used to walk together in relationship, and now what is Adam doing? He's hiding from God. He can't have fellowship with him any longer because of guilt and shame and sin. The great loss of the fall and the sin in our hearts that has come from Adam, it's been imputed to all of us, is in Romans now, we're enemies of God. We're at enmity. We don't want to bow to him. We want our own way. We want to be God, just like Adam and Eve. And so there's the, the curse, is that we, we've broken relationship with God and we're at enmity with him because of the fall. The second thing is we're at enmity with our own selves. We hide now because we are ashamed. And the quietness of our hearts, we all know guilt and shame, and we hide. The nakedness was an idiom for guilt and shame. Just cover up who I am. Let me sow some fig leaves so I don't feel ashamed and guilty of who I really am. There's just kind of a lack of ease now with who you are. We don't want to admit the worst about ourselves. We fight it. But we are utterly dependent upon God. We were created that way. And what we do is we lack any kind of peace or wholeness because of what the fall has done to us. Thirdly, it broke our relationship with others. And they made fig leaves, but at first it was to cover up their nakedness with each other. We can't let others truly know then who we are. We have to cover and hide. There was this one, I think he was a theologian, his name was Billy Joel. And Billy Joel said, have you ever let anyone see the stranger in yourself? You know, you, you hide. No one will ever really show that little hidden stranger of who you are. And what we will do all of our days is just cover and hide and not reveal. If people really know us, we will lose control. And so I've got to put on fronts and I've got to have appearances and I want to keep up with the Joneses and I've got all these things that I cannot let people know who I really am. I have to control what you think about me. And my whole life is trying to get people to think rightly about me and worship me. And that's the battle and the, the breaking of all of mankind in the fall. Adam chucks his wife under the bus. A woman made me do it. Look at verse 16. To the woman, he said, I'm going to greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Is that true, ladies? The epidural is the answer. I'm telling you. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and in pain you're going to bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband. And that desire in, in Cain in the next chapter is a desire to control. And you're going to desire to control your husband, and he's going to rule over you. And there's going to be this battle of the sexes ever since the fall. And there's this brokenness now and marital bliss that God designed and now we just see marriages breaking and falling apart because of what happened this day in Genesis. And then I want you to look at verse 17 of what happened with nature. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. You're going to have to labor with the land now. Thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. I knew those weren't natural. Those are curse. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, you were made from it. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You're going to die. 
And now you got to go fight all of your days to work and labor to get food and produce and life. And so work is not cursed, but the hardness of it is cursed. And now you're going to have to go work. The the ground's going to fight you. Nature is going to be against you. That's our battle. Irma Bombeck. She said the main enemy of her life was dirt. (laughs) Dirt. She says you change diapers all day long. You clean dishes. You vacuum the rug. You clean the sheets. And she just goes on and on all day long. My life is a fight against dirt. And at the end of your life, after all of this trouble, what do you get? Six feet of dirt. (laughs) That's the fall. That's what's happened is we're all going to die and go back to dirt because of what Adam did in that garden. Nature was supposed to serve us and now it fights us. Why do dogs bark at us when we walk by? They know you got to quarrel with their master. It's no longer our friend, it's an enemy because we are an enemy to its Lord. So guys, everything has been broken down because of Adam. All of us. I've chosen God now not to be our masters. We're spiritual stillborns from Adam. And we come in wanting to be the master of our own ship. That's the brokenness, is there's a God who is so beautiful and glorious and lovely. And he should be worshipped and served and adored. And we come in saying, I want to be loved and worshipped. And everything is about me. I'm the center reference point. That's what this terrible fall has done to created ones in the image of God. That is wrong. That's what's wrong with our world. Maybe you're experiencing that this morning. And you've come in and you're experiencing the fallenness and the brokenness that it's always December but never Christmas in this world. And everything you put your hand to, it doesn't satisfy. It's vanity of vanities like Solomon found out. This is what sin has done to this world and what it's done to us. I heard an illustration this week. If, a, if your five-year-old asked you, can I drive your car, daddy? What would you say? Sure, here you go. They will ruin the car and maybe kill everyone in the car. But the man said, we got behind the wheel in Genesis 3 and everything fell apart. Came out from under God and everything has been subjected to death and futility by what the enemy did in Genesis. So in closing, and this is for real, Someone made fun of me during that First John series. Curtsy. It's curtsy. So in closing, for real, I want to look at one last aspect of the curse. And now he's going to curse the devil. And if you'll come with me to verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, And more than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And so I just want you to get this first. From cover to cover of this Bible, God is sovereign over the devil. And even by the conclusion I read in Revelation 20, he throws him in the pit whenever he wants. The devil is a junkyard dog tethered to the will of God. He's sovereign. God is sovereign over him. Okay? God never says, oops. Where did that come from? He tricked me. I wish I could have stopped him. You see, instantly there's a curse upon the serpent. Who's in control? God. And the serpent was the instrument of Satan, and it's cursed anyways. And on your belly you will go, and dust you're going to eat all the days of your life. The cursing of the snake is a perpetual reminder. As you see, it's slithering and eating in the dirt all of its days. It's a reminder. It's a picture of the devastation and the reproach that Satan bears for what he did that day in Genesis 3. Guys, what did Satan want? He's the anointed cherub. He was the highest ranking one of all the angels. He wanted more. And Isaiah, he kept saying, I want, I want, I I want to go higher. I want to be above God. And what happened to him? He was thrown down and he was cast to earth. And now he wants to exalt himself as sovereign over man by breaking his allegiance to God here on this earth. And he's thrown down again here by eating the dust. The snake slithering in the dirt as a reminder of the humiliation of Satan. The divine judgment of God upon that serpent. 
The dust represents defeat. To lick the dust was an enemy who was defeated. It's a symbol of being totally defeated. And then look with me in verse 15. There's the serpent, and now he'll go to Satan. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Satan took a third of the angels with him from heaven. And now in the garden, he seeks to take over the world. And he captures Adam and Eve by causing them to distrust God and disobey God. And he has to feel that he just made a big dent in God's creation. It's no longer paradise, victory. He has the devotion now of Adam and Eve. I've captured humanity and they can help me overthrow God because angels don't reproduce and now I got those that do reproduce and they're going to reproduce seed for me all of my days. I got them. And instantly, Satan, you're wrong. God says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. Satan's seed then is all who follow him, all who distrust God and disobey God all of his lies and believing that God can't be trusted. And Jesus in John 8 said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. You're, you're liars and murderers just like him. And so the seed of the devil is all he can't reproduce, but it's all who come into this world are born under the curse that he brought. And they're liars and murderers and deceivers, and they're of their father, the devil. But Eve's seed in this context here is referring to not everyone who's ever going to be born, but to believers. So it's not just humanity. Her seed, there's going to be those who come forth from her seed who are going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what you have here is the history of the entire world explained. You now, he says, you're going to have two seeds warring against each other. And you see it in the rest of Genesis in the next chapter Cain is going to kill Abel. And just trace Genesis all the way to Revelation, and there's these two seeds waging and fighting. There's a war all the way through up to this day as we sit here this morning. There are two lions battling. There's a battle with darkness and light. There's the kingdom of the devil and the kingdom of God existing right now in our midst. And guys, this explains the world as we're not home yet. That's what Christmas is. Come home. But we live in a spiritual battle. And as I was thinking about it, the, I'm going to say that for the end. The seed of the devil and the seed of Eve, which are believers in Christ. This is why this world is so evil and broken. I want you to catch that because I hear people say, why is this world so evil? I can't believe there's a God. This is why those in the kingdom of God are so Beautiful. Because we trust God. And we do come under allegiance now to King Jesus. Your will is my will. And there's something so beautiful in the midst of all the seed of the devil that distrust God and live only for themselves that he's calling out these people for himself that will come under the lordship of Jesus Christ and trust God that he's given us everything in Christ Jesus. In the midst of some of the afflictions that you guys are facing now, there's, a, there's an ability to trust God who's working everything for our good and bringing us to glory. Satan is so smug and proud of himself here in Genesis 3. And God curses him even more. And he says, you dupe. You just played into my eternal, beautiful, perfect plan, you little lackey, to put the sun on display for all the nations to look upon him and marvel and worship Jesus Christ for all of eternity. You have been my little errand boy to bring about the greatest glory that could ever be devised in the human history of mankind. What you meant for evil, I meant for good. The greatest and the ultimate good is to take Jesus Christ and put him on display. And I want you to listen to the rest then of the curse on Satan. God says, he shall bruise you on the head. And you shall bruise him on the heel in verse 15. Isn't that kind of strange? It's weird. You got plural here going, your seed and her seed are going to be fighting. They're both plural and that's all that are going to come. There's going to be battles going on. And now he switches to the singular. He says, he. Who is he? Well, there's going to be one who's going to come from Eve's seed. 
And he's going to come into this world and he's going to bruise, which this word means to crush your head, devil. You are going to be destroyed by this he. He is going to just crush your head. And you're going to bruise him on the heel. There's going to be a battle later than in the history of this world, as is telling us. And the devil, you will bruise this seed, but he will literally destroy you. And he is going to come, and he's going to totally undo the works that you have just done, plunging humanity into this estrangement from God and everything that's come with it, all the brokenness that came into this world in Genesis 3. You have brought death into the world, Satan, but he will come and bring eternal life to all who will believe upon him. You have separated this seed from its creator and God, and he's going to come and bring us back to God. He's going to heal our shame and our guilt. So instead of hiding from God, you're going to be able to come back and dwell in fellowship with God again in peace and not guilty and no shame in the presence of a God who knows you perfect. He's going to bring that back. He's going to come and he's going to heal our broken relationships. And we're going to be naked and unashamed again in fellowship and community. Here is who I am in Christ. And he'll bring nature back into its place where it's going to serve us. And so my question this morning, who is he? Christ Jesus, it is he. This is the promise of Jesus Christ, giving Satan a decisive death blow and crushing his head. And he's going to undo all of the works that we just saw in Genesis 3. So what is the power that Satan had in Genesis 3? What power did Satan come away with? Why is he so smug? What does Jesus need to come into this world and reverse from this offense? Sin and the consequences of sin. They chose sin over God and sin plunged us into ruin and death. And sin is the problem. Sin is what has broken everything with us and God other in this world. It is sin. That was the thing that threw this whole world into such chaos. How can we be friends with sin? It's an enemy of God and it's destroyed everything. Sin is what brought death and destruction. Sin is our enemy. Sin is what has given Satan teeth and power over death. The soul that sins must die. The very justice of God has to be satisfied for sin. He says you are guilty of breaking the whole law for one sin. The justice of God must be satisfied to punish sin. Satan can rightfully charge every one of us as unbelievers with sin. When you get on your deathbed and you stand before God and he says, guilty of sin, you're going to have no argument before the living God. And you'll be cast down into an eternal justice and wrath forever. God's justice must punish sin or he's not God. What power the devil held over us was death. And it was eternal death because of sin. The seed of Eve, he must come and deal with sin by satisfying God's justice for it. Look with me in Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. There's the Trinity knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out of the presence of God. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the way back to the tree of life. My, the tree of life, to come back into paradise with God, relationship with God. It's protected by a sword of justice that turns in every direction. You're not going to sneak in. Turns in every direction, this sword. 
There's no way back in because this sword is looming over the entrance back into the presence of God. And so one then must come under the judgment of the sword of God for sin. There's no other way back in. That sword has to be satisfied. And I want you to hear a thousand years before Jesus came into this world, Isaiah said this in chapter 53. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, our own thoughts, our own philosophies. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon his son. And that sword that moved in every direction pierced his own son through until he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because you have to take this sword right through your very soul and die for what happened in Genesis 3. Jesus Christ went under the sword on a cross and God slew him. And he's been wounded to bring us back to the tree of life. To bring us back, I want you to hear this, is carefully worded, to the favorable presence of God. To bring you back into the favorable presence of God like we saw in Genesis 1 through 2. The glory of glory and the irony of ironies to me is the original tree of life became a tree of death. And the cross, which was a tree of death, becomes a tree of life for all who will come to Christ and believe upon him for what he's done. The glory of God is that another Adam, a second Adam came into this world and where Adam failed, this Adam would be tempted and he would never cave in to the lies of act for yourself, jump, mistrust God. All the temptations were about not trusting God. He's not gonna take care of you. And that devil would not win against the second Adam. And he would have victory over him and he would go to a cross and he would take that sword of justice that everyone in this room deserved so that you could be forgiven of every sin that you've ever committed and be brought back into the favorable presence of God, naked and unashamed before your God to undo what the devil did in Genesis 3. Praise God for he who left heaven and came to earth and was born of a virgin in a manger to crush the serpent's head for us. And in closing, for real, <laughs> I'm gonna be aware of it, Greg, from here on out, thank you. Um, to answer my earlier question, why did he not just destroy the devil right there in Genesis 3? Why did he not crush his head right there in that garden? Colossians 1 says, For by him Christ all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. Everything's been made by Christ and everything is for his glory. And so the reason he wasn't crushed right there was for the glory of Jesus Christ to be put on display. All things are for him. The Son of God gets more glory by destroying the devil this way than just raw power in destroying him in the garden. There's more glory in the Son of God hanging on a cross, fixing this problem and remedying it. What love, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? What a beautiful, better way to deal with this problem than just crushing him there. If he would have destroyed him in Genesis 3, you would have never had a he saving us by his cross and his life and we would still be in our guilt and our sin. By doing it this way, he redeems us back from sin and all of its consequences and he wins our heart by the way he did it so that now he has our allegiance he doesn't just take it. He wins us eternally by the Son of God dying on a cross in our place. 
as we now come under his lordship, we find the healing right now beginning from the works of the devil. And he begins now doing that in our lives. He's done much of it and he will do more when he returns. On the last day, there will be no more effects forever from this sad day in the garden of Eden. There'll be no more effects, not even one for all of eternity. He will undo the work of the devil. The one born on Christmas had to take on flesh and blood to be born of Eve, to become from that seed and stand in our place and take the sting of death and sin away that he, he is what the world was waiting for. And so I want to close with one of my favorite Christmas hymns by Isaac Watts, just a line. He said, no more let sins and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, oh joy to the world. He's come to undo what the curse did. So where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so now I want to give my life. The, the, the devil and his people hate the seed of Christ. And, and, and the question is, do we have enmity towards them? And a lot of people get that wrong. And, and what my enmity now is against the lies of the devil. And I'm going to give my life to expose those lies and tell people the truth of the way back to God, the way to undo the curse. And so I'm at enmity against the lies of the devil that are killing souls eternally that still have the power of sin on their death day. And I'm going to fight against that. I'm at enmity with that. I'm going to be against it till I quit breathing. And I pray that you will be against such lies and destruction that people are sitting maybe even here this morning in the lie of the devil and they're destroying and they're hiding and they're trying to put on fig leaves and they're, they're hearing the world say, this works, this is true. We're opposed to that. We're at enmity to such a lie because it's going to destroy your soul forever. And I love you enough tell you that Jesus Christ came into this world to remove this curse forever. And if you will come this morning to him and believe in what he has done, you will have this eternal life through this seed that he has given by his work on the cross and the perfect life that he lived in our place. So I pray this morning that you would come and receive him. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for the one who's going to come and stamp and destroy the head of that serpent. God, I thank you for the one who hung on Calvary's tree and breathed his last and lived a perfect life and was buried and is raised on the third day and now seated in glory. I thank you that he was just bit on the heel and he now lives in life and gives life to all who come to the eternal life, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for a better second Adam. I thank you for the one who did not fail, but the one who would not come out from under his allegiance to you, the one who would not mistrust his father. God, thank you for this Christ and thank you that this morning we are in him and that it's as if we had that victory and we now live in Christ. God, thank you for the second Adam. Thank you that that devil was destroyed by his work. And I thank you that now we live in this battle, but it's a, a sure victory at the end. He will be thrown in that lake of fire forever. And we will be brought into the new paradise where we will be safe. No no threats ever again for all of eternity, naked and unashamed, loving and walking in the garden with you, O God. Your gospel is too good. We thank you for it. We praise you, we believe it, and we trust it this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.